Welcome, everybody, to the uh, plenary session uh, with the SIG Ecom um, presented awards. Uh, so I'd like to start off this session with an old award, which is for Kira Goldner. In 2020, uh, we had, and actually we still do have, but I've been unable to recruit volunteers to, to manage it. We have a, a presentation award. So, um, Kevin, who just left, has always felt strongly like we celebrate the papers, but what we consume are the talks. And so we should also celebrate the talks. And so EC 2020 had a Best Presentation Award, and the Best Presentation was awarded to Kira Goldner for her talk on Optimal Mechanism Design for Single-Minded Agents. It's to a student or postdoc. I guess you were a postdoc at the time. Um, so. It comes with a $250 check, which I think you already got, but let me know. <laughs> and uh, a certificate, which I am very delighted to hand to you. And you should all watch her talk. It's on our CGCOM YouTube channel. Fantastic talk. Got the best presentation award. All right, um, moving on, we also, uh, as a SIG, organize a Best Dissertation Award. And uh, so this year, uh, which it's the 2021 Dissertation Award because obviously it was published in 2021, even though we're now in 2022, uh, the award goes to Ellen Vitterick, um, whose thesis was titled Automated Algorithm and Mechanism Configuration, advised by Nina Balkin and Thomas Sandholm. Ellen's thesis makes extensive contributions towards establishing the rigorous foundations of automated algorithm configuration, where data-driven machine learning and optimization are used to fine-tune an algorithm's parameters for application-specific performance guarantees. Her groundbreaking thesis provides among the first provable generalization guarantees for automated algorithm configuration an important application domain of automated algorithmic configuration analyzed in depth in her thesis is automated mechanism design, where the goal is to design a mechanism from data to optimize for the mechanism's performance, such as revenue. Ellen's thesis includes additional applications of automated algorithmic configuration, such as integer programming, linear and quadratic, and computational biology. So I am very pleased to uh, give Ellen, this wonderful award, um, and uh, I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, and thank you so much uh, to the award committee. For, uh, it's really an honor uh, to have received the award. Um, so the title of this thesis is Automated Algorithm and Mechanism Configuration, and I was very fortunate to have it advised by Nina Vulcan and Thomas Sandholm. Sorry, just a second. Just click on, move the mouse to the right end screen. Okay. Uh, so is it working? Kind no. of. It worked briefly. Yeah, maybe. Okay, maybe if I just stand here, it will work. Okay, um, so the topic, I'm gonna give an overview of my thesis and the main topics of my thesis. Uh, where discrete optimization, and in particular integer programming, both linear and quadratic, um, as well as computational biology, uh, but I'm not gonna talk so much about comp bio in this talk. Um, and the other main topic was mechanism design. And so in this talk, I'm gonna describe overarching structure linking these two different areas, um, as well, and I'll describe how research, say, in integer programming inspired research in mechanism design, and vice versa. And the linking thread in my thesis between these two areas is automated algorithm and mechanism configuration. So algorithms used in practice are typically very broadly applicable, able to solve problems across diverse domains. Um, but these very broadly applicable algorithms can often have unsatisfactory default, out-of-the-box performance with slow runtimes, poor solution quality, among other downfalls. And I think this is perhaps best illustrated by integer programming, where IP solvers like Cplex and Groby just come with a ton of tunable parameters. And tuning these parameters by hand is just a notoriously slow, 
tedious and error-prone process. So CPLEX, for example, comes with a 170-page manual describing 172 different tunable parameters, and tuning these parameters is just very difficult. But with a deft configuration of these parameters, these algorithms can be used to solve very computationally challenging problems. And the same phenomenon arises in mechanism design as well. So you can think of a mechanism as a special type of algorithm where the input is a set of bids by the agents and the output is an allocation of some items for sale along with the payments. And just a slightly misspecified parameter like a price or a reserve can cause a really big drop in revenue. So this raises a question, what's the best configuration of my algorithm or of my mechanism for the particular application domain at hand. In integer programming, for example, the best solver configuration for solving the specific routing problems that a shipping company has to solve day after day is probably not particularly well suited for solving the scheduling problems that an airline has to solve week after week. Similarly, in mechanism design, as we all know, the optimal mechanism depends very intimately on the specific distribution over agents' values. So how do we go about uh, tuning these mechanism or algorithms parameters so that they're very good on our particular application? Well, in practice, we often have ample data about the particular application in which we'll be using the algorithm, data that we could potentially harness to optimize its performance. So for example, a shipping company will have access to all of the routing problems it had to solve over the course of a year or more. And the question is, how can it use this data to configure its solver so it solves these types of problems very quickly in the future. So over the past two decades or so, there's been quite a lot of research on using machine learning in the context of discrete optimization, especially from an applied perspective. So we've seen research by Kevin Leighton Brown and others on integer and linear programming, constraint satisfaction, mechanism design, computational biology, among many other areas. And these are just a few of the very early papers that looked at using machine learning in these optimization contexts. In, context, in contrast, there's surprisingly little known about this topic from a theoretical perspective. But this started to change about five years or so ago. And we started to see a surge of interest in these data-driven algorithm design problems from a theoretical perspective, including in the context of automated configuration and selection, which is where a lot of my research has been, inspired by a paper by Tim Roofgarden and Rishi Gupta, as well as in the context of learning augmented algorithms where worst-case algorithms are augmented with some machine-learned hints about the input distribution. Stretching back further uh, than just the past five years, there's been a huge amount of interest in using machine learning for mechanism design and in particular revenue maximization, but with really like an increase of interest maybe in the past eight years or so. So what would this automated approach to configuration look like? So at a high level, first we would fix some parameters algorithm or mechanism. We would receive a training set of typical problem instances from some unknown application-specific distribution D. So for example, in the context of mechanism design, every input would be a sample from the distribution over agents' values. In the context of integer programming, every input would be a routing integer program for, that a specific shipping company has to solve, for example. We'd perform some optimizations, and we'd find a parameter setting, row hat, which has good average empirical performance over the training set. And by performance, I mean in the context of mechanism design, it has good revenue. In the context of algorithm design, it has good runtime, solution quality, and so on. So there are a couple of key questions we need to answer about this procedure. First of all, how do we find a configuration which has good average empirical performance over the training set? This has been studied quite a lot, especially from an applied perspective over the past decade or so. Um, but the question I'm gonna focus on in this talk is more of a statistical nature, which is whatever parameter setting row hat we came up with using your favorite black box parameter optimization algorithm from the previous slide, for example, will that parameter setting have good future performance on problems from the same application, but which aren't already in our training set? Or a bit more firmly, is the expected performance of this parameter setting also high on this unknown distribution? 
And let me point out what are some of the primary challenges we face in providing these types of theoretical guarantees in these combinatorial domains. And it's really that an algorithm's performance is just a notoriously volatile function of its parameters. And intuitively, this is because in these combinatorial domains, if you just tweak the algorithm's parameters by a little bit, you can cause a cascade of changes in its behaviors, which causes these jumps in its performance. So overall, there's just a very complex connection between an algorithm's parameters and its performance on any given input. But meanwhile, for those functions that we really understand well from a theoretical perspective in machine learning, there's typically a fairly straightforward connection between a function's parameters and its value on any given input. And since we don't really have this predictable, straightforward structure in combinatorial algorithm design, we have to understand what structure is there that we can use to provide these types of theoretical guarantees. So I'm going to start off by highlighting some of our research in the context of integer programming, and then I'm going to quickly move on to unifying theoretical results which connect integer programming to mechanism design as well as, as, well as other combinatorial problems. And this is primarily from a paper with Nina Balkin, Travis Dick, and Thomas Santom. So in integer programming, our goal is to find a vector z that maximizes some linear function c dot z subject to some linear constraints, a z is less than or equal to b, and subject to the constraint that some of these variables have to be integral. And of course, integer programming has a ton of applications. So in the context of mechanism design, it's used for combinatorial auction winner determination, as well as many other areas like routing, manufacturing, scheduling, planning, and many others. And the most widely used algorithm for solving integer programs is branch and bound, used under the hood by commercial solvers like Cplex and Gurobi. And at a very high level, this is how branch and bound works. You start off, uh, let's say that this is a feasible region of our integer program. Branch and bound recursively partitions the feasible set, searching each, partition, uh, each set of the partition for a locally optimal solution until it can verify that it's found the globally optimal solution. And it organizes this partition with a tree data structure. And in this talk, I'm going to be, or in this paper, we're focused on building small trees. First of all, that leads to good memory usage. And second, uh, roughly speaking, all else being equal, smaller trees will help us solve the integer program faster. And the specific policy or procedure we use to create this partition has a big impact on the size of the tree that branch and bound builds. And in this paper, we look at partitioning policies, which are parameterized by some detunable parameters row. For the experts in particular, these uh, parameters control a convex combination of scoring rules that we use in our variable selection policy. And as I was alluding to earlier, tree size is just a very volatile function of its, the branch and bounds parameters. So for example, we prove that for any tiny interval of the parameter space, there exists infinitely many distributions over integer programs, such that for any parameter setting in that interval, branch and bound builds a tree of constant size with probability one. And for any other parameter setting, it builds a tree of exponential size and expectation. But uh, nonetheless, despite this volatility, we're able to identify some very useful structure, which is that tree size is a piecewise constant function of these tunable parameters. And moreover, the boundaries between regions are defined by hyperplanes. And in the next section, I'm going to describe how this structure implies these types of statistical bounds that I was alluding to earlier. And in doing so, I'm also going to tie in mechanism design as well as other combinatorial problems like computational biology, greedy algorithm configuration, and clustering. And this will be primarily from a Stock 21 paper with Nina Balkin, Dan de Blasio, Travis Dick, Carl Kingsford, and Thomas Santom. So to talk about um, algorithm configuration in this very general setting, capturing all of these different problems, I'm going to uh, introduce a bit of notation. So I'm going to say u rho of x is the utility of the algorithm defined by parameters rho on the input x. So capital X is a set of problem instances. So in the context of mechanism design, x would be a set of valuation vectors. In the context of integer programming, x would be a set of integer programs of a certain size. 
And um, by utility, I mean, for example, it's runtime, solution quality, revenue, and, and so on. And if I collect the set of all such functions u row, I'm going to denote it u, and I'm going to refer to it as a primal function class. And typically in learning theory, we provide these types of generalization statistical bounds by understanding the intrinsic complexity of this primal function class u, using notions like VC dimension, Rademacher complexity, um, and so on, which you might have heard of. But the challenge in these combinatorial domains is that this primal function class u is pretty gnarly. So for example, in integer programming, every element of the domain of these functions in this set x is an integer program. So it's unclear how to plot or even visualize these functions u row. And there are certainly no obvious notions of Lipschitz continuity or smoothness that we can rely on to bound that intrinsic complexity of the primal function class. This is where the notion of a dual function comes in handy. So rather than fix the parameters rho and vary the input x, we could just as well fix the input x and vary the parameters rho, and we get utility as a function of the parameters. And as you would hope, ux of rho equals u rho of x. And if I collect the set of all such functions ux, I'll denote it u star, and I'll refer to it as a dual function class. Utility as a function of the parameters. And what's really nice about these dual functions is that they have this simple Euclidean domain, RD, the set of all parameters. And they often have ample structure that we can use to bound the intrinsic complexity of the class that we actually care about, the primal function class U. And in particular, what we already saw a few slides ago is that in the context of integer programming, these dual functions, tree size as a function of the parameters, is piecewise constant. But we also see piecewise structure in a lot of other places. So for example, in mechanism configuration, we find that across a wide variety of mechanism classes, revenue is a piecewise linear function of the parameters. And this is perhaps easiest to see in the context of the second price auction with a tunable reserve row. So let's imagine that we fixed a set of bids and we're tuning some uh, reserve row along the horizontal axis. And let's say that the second highest bid falls here, highest bid falls there, and we're going to plot revenue. So when the reserve is smaller than that second highest bid, highest bidder wins, pays the maximum of the reserve in the second highest bid. In that interval, that's the second highest bid, so that's just a constant function. In the next highest interval, so highest bidder still wins. Now they pay the max of the reserve and the second highest bid, which is now the reserve. So that's just the function f of rho equals rho. Finally, in the largest interval, no one wins anything, no one pays anything, revenue is just zero. So indeed, revenue is a piecewise linear function of the parameters. These dual functions are piecewise linear. But we see this structure in many other settings beyond the second price auction, various other types of auction mechanisms, pricing mechanisms, and randomized mechanisms. Across all of these, these dual functions are piecewise linear. And we found other piecewise structure in other contexts as well, piecewise inverse quadratic and, and many other structures. And I'll just mention that in the context of online algorithm configuration and mechanism configuration, where the instances are arriving online, not necessarily for any distribution, myself and others have used this kind of piecewise Lipschitz structure to provide regret bounds in the context of online configuration. OK, so now with this notion of a piecewise structured dual function, I'm going to describe to you the flavor of our main result. I'm going to start with a picture. So let's say that we're tuning these two parameters, row 1, row 2. And in general, there could be any number of tunable parameters. But for the picture, let's say that there are two. And we're plotting the dual function. So for some fixed input x, we're looking at utility as a function of the parameters. So this could be, again, like revenue, runtime, solution quality, and so on. So let's say that for any input x, there are functions f from some set f which partition the parameter space into regions. So here there are three functions partitioning the parameter space into six regions, such that in any one region, this dual function is equal to some function g from some set g. So in this picture, g would be the set of all constant functions, but it could be any set of functions. So let's say that the structure holds for any input x of our problem. We prove that with high probability for any choice of the parameters row, the difference between the algorithm's average empirical utility over the training set and its expected utility 
is bounded by h, where h is an upper bound on utility over the support of our distribution, times the square root of the pseudo dimension of the dual of the set of piece functions plus the VC dimension of the dual of the set of boundary functions. So many of you have probably seen these notions of VC and pseudo dimension before, but just in case, they're just notions of like how intrinsically complex are these sets of boundary and piece functions, and in particular their duals, times log k, where k is the number of boundary functions creating this piecewise partition for any dual function. So in this picture, k would be three, divided by n, where n is the size of our training set. So now I'm going to just give a quick one slide proof sketch of this, of this result. Um, and we're gonna start off by fixing any set X of problem instances. So every problem instance is gonna correspond to K boundary functions. And the first thing we're gonna do is count the number of regions induced by these size of S times K boundary functions. And interestingly, this depends not on the VC dimension of the set of boundary functions, but rather on the VC dimension of the dual of the set of boundary functions. Okay, now fix is one region. In any one region, across all of the instances X in our set S, the dual functions are simultaneously structured. They're all constant, linear, or some other nice function, whatever G is. And the next thing we do is count the number of parameters in that region, parameter settings in that region, which lead to significantly different performance over the set S. And we use the pseudo dimension of the dual of the set of piece functions. Finally, we aggregate all of these bounds across all of these regions to get that the pseudo dimension of the primal function class, U, is bounded by the pseudo dimension of the dual of the set of pieces plus the VC dimension of the dual of the set of boundaries times log K. And this applies our, our main theorem. So now I'll just tell you about a few applications of this theorem. First of all, in this um, paper, we provide new bounds for voting mechanism configuration and computational biology, algorithm configuration, various problems in CompBio. Um, we recover bounds from existing literature on revenue maximization, clustering, and greedy algorithm configuration. And going back to that structure we saw in the context of integer programming, uh, this theorem implies a bound that, bound that depends on the number of parameters and uh, the number of variables in our integer programs. So um, now I'm just gonna give a one slide overview of a related piece uh, of work, a EC19 paper with Nina Balkan and Thomas Santholm, which I view as kind of complementary to this line of research on revenue maximization via machine learning. I uh, just give one slide kind of giving idea of the results we prove and the motivation. So in this paper, our goal is to estimate how far a manipulable mechanism is from incentive compatible, just using samples from this unknown distribution over agents types. And the motivation is that oftentimes in uh, machine learning for mechanism design, the mechanisms that we're de designing are actually manipulable. So for example, maybe they're represented by neural networks uh, and we don't necessarily have incentive compatibility guarantees for these networks. So the idea is to, that you can use this estimate to understand just how far away is whatever me uh, mechanism I learned from being incentive compatible. So I th see this as kind of going hand in hand with this lar larger line of research on sample complexity of revenue maximization. And I'm happy to talk about this more after the talk. But for now, I'll just wrap up with some conclusions and future directions. So overall, I described in my uh, thesis research on integer programming, mechanism design, and briefly mentioned uh, computational biology. And then I described overarching structure, which links these different areas, uh, which allowed us to provide unifying theoretical guarantees. So a couple future directions. In this talk, I really focused on how many samples do I need to find the best algorithm in some given class of algorithms. But this raises a question with respect to the distribution in particular, how good is that best algorithm in my class? Maybe my algorithm family contains some worst case optimal distribution, but does it contain an algorithm that competes with the best algorithm I could possibly design for that particular distribution? And to answer these types of questions, maybe we can take inspiration from the literature on mechanism design, where typically in the single item setting, 
people prove that their learned mechanism competes with Meyerson's optimal auction, which we know is optimal for the particular distribution at hand. Uh, another direction is to close the loop between classical algorithm design and data-driven algorithm design. So in my thesis, classical algorithm design very much inspired data-driven algorithm design because it inspired what, uh, what classes of algorithms should we try to optimize over. But I think there are many ways in which data-driven algorithm design can also provide guidance for classical algorithm design and analysis. And in particular, sometimes in these data-driven approaches, we find configurations or algorithms that work really well, but which no one has really thought to study before. So are there ways in which we these data-driven approaches to algorithm design can help us better understand these computational problems from a classical, maybe even worst case analysis perspective. So with that, I'll wrap up. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. We have some time for questions if uh, people have questions. and. If you could throw the gather on the screen, we can also take questions from, from the online audience. Uh, yes. Uh, hello. Um, yeah, that's a very cool um, general approach to give generalization upper bound on some learning problem. I was wondering whether your framework can also give a lower bound on the generalization bound. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so indeed, we proved that the main theorem that I described provide it's it's um, tight for, say, specific algorithm families, like from computational biology or mechanism design, um, for the pseudo-dimension bound. So I, I showed an upper bound in the pseudo-dimension, which implied that sample complexity bound. But uh, these pseudo-dimension bounds don't necessarily, tight lower bounds don't necessarily imply tight sample complexity lower bounds. So I think that's a great kind of open direction for future research. Thank you. Great, other questions? Um, so I guess I was, this is maybe a detailed question, but I was looking in the result you presented from, I think it was stock, you had this parameter k and this like g function, and it feels like there's some inherent trade-off, like if I have more yeah. regions, I can get simpler g's. And if I have fewer regions, I can get more complex Gs. So like, how do you, is, is there a systematic way to find the right trade-off there? Yeah, I think that's another great direction uh, for, for future research because indeed I, there, there definitely is a trade-off between like the number of partitions you put down. Um, oftentimes in these algorithm configuration contexts, there's like a very natural way to see what the partitions are. In particular, you see like in what region of the space would the algorithm kind of favor one solution over the other or like in mechanism design one bundle over the other. Um, so that's, but yeah, there's a trade-off and I, we don't have a systematic way of optimizing yet. Cool. All right, let's uh, thank the speaker again and thank you. Thank you.